And there you are, 40 meters underground, fighting through what was formerly known as a subway station. There's no light, and even though it's 11 a.m., you could barely see through your night vision without infrared illumination. Your ammunition is running low, and you're thirsty, and your radio cannot punch through the thick earth above you, so you cannot call for a Kazavak. Since you also can't call for artillery or aerial fires, you're forced slogging it through up close with an enemy who's dug in behind a two feet thick reinforced concrete wall with a machine gun. Every shot you take reverberates and echoes through your head. You can't hear your teammates. Then a flashbang hits and it touches off a fire in the corner of the hall. Smoke fills the room. Electricity is off, and there's no ventilation. You can't breathe. This scenario encapsulates some of the characteristics of the subterranean or sub-T operations. And today, <clears throat> I have my friend Ashley, a U.S. Army infantry and simulations officer, who recently published a paper in the Light Fighters Manifesto on sub-T operations. She discusses some of the difficulties and potential solutions for these sub-T operations, which, as a reminder, as humans start to build cities and urban areas down more, the chances of us working underground are increasing by the day. Disclaimer. These are our views expressed in this episode and do not represent any official views. Tell us about yourself. What uh, What's your background? So... Ashley McGuire. Um, I've got military experience both as an infantry officer and as a simulations officer, um, as well as just being, you know, an avid shooter and overall nerd with arms and armor. So yeah, that's me in a nutshell. So, if I were to translate Ashley's background to you guys, right? Infantry officer. She's a warfighter. She's trained to actually conduct uh, war on the ground, controlling troops going forward, and training those troops to do and accomplish missions and tasks. She's a Sims officer, which means that she thinks about and plans and, and, and executes ways of training future troops in order to adopt to what we see that's changing in the battlefield in the future. So you've got someone who is both a warfighter and a war thinker right here. So with that in mind, subterranean operations, sub-T in short. What is it? Why are we worried about it? What are your thoughts on it? So first and foremost, you know, subterranean operations is a subset of urban operations. And why we're concerned with it is just kind of general urbanization. You know, most future wars we think will be fought in urban areas. You know, right now, 50% of the world's population lives in urban areas. We expect that to be 70% by 2050. So as urban areas grow, you know, there's going to become a point where they can't grow wider and they can't grow taller. So they're going to grow lower. And you had already brought up Japan. And uh, recently there was a referendum in Tokyo to where it, I believe in Tokyo and could be other parts of Japan as well. They describe property rights legally now as extending up to 40 meters underground. So there's already some trends that are starting to unfold to show increasing urbanization, you know, going down and not just up. And so that component of operations in those urban areas is what brings us to sub-T. Urban AO is divided into a few different spaces and areas. You have your surface, ground level, super surface, which are kind of stories and elevated positions in buildings or other things above the surface. Uh, and then you have your subsurface. And this is, of course, all bounded by airspace and the maritime domains and also the cyber domain. So those are all things that that's kind of how the urban area of operations is broken down. But subterranean warfare deals with the subsurface aspect of that. So there's some things that are similar 
to urban operations and many commonalities, but there are some things that are very, very, very unique to the subterranean environment specifically. Now, I mean, w one thing that already jumps out at me, you're talking about the different domains. Automatically, you're cutting out the air, you're cutting out the air domain and a lot of surface capabilities that you would have as an infantry officer. So you don't have fires, you have no artillery, no mortar, right. you have no air support, no CAS, close air support, um, none of that. So basically, a lot of those tools that we use as U.S. military officers on ground to soften up a target before you push your men in to minimize the risk for your troops, automatically denied for any of those company level officers. Right. And that's one of the things that is very, very unique to subterranean operations. It's very, very hard to influence with, with different, you know, weapon systems or capabilities. So for example, you know, it's one, it's very, very hard to collect on. It's very, very hard to build situational awareness on because, you know, your standard, you know, reconnaissance and ISR, you know, won't necessarily tell you a whole lot about the subterranean environment. And one of the key things with sub T is knowledge of that tunnel system or underground facility is really going to be decisive. Uh, so whether you're the defender or the attacker, you know, knowledge is power and building, you know, situational awareness building understanding on what's actually down there without the use of like LIDAR, LIDAR capabilities or ground penetrating radar is going to be incredibly challenging. And then again, it's also going to be really, really hard to influence with fires or, or air assets. Uh, the only possible exception being is, you know, kind of hitting entrances and either suppressing or destroying those entrances potentially with fires or casts or something like that, which, you know, if you're going to bypass and believe that you can, it's always an option. It's a fundamental part of any of these kind of urban centers that have huge population densities. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you can't go out and you can only go up so far, you know, they start going down. And then another component of that is, you know, once you leave the U.S., like you alluded to, is all of these countries, you know, in urban centers, they usually have mass transit centers that involve, you know, thousands of kilometers of subway tunnels. And so right there, you now have, you know, easily navigable, hardened subterranean structures that could be, you know, axes of advance, lines of communication or supply routes all over the world. And that's just one small piece that could become a part of, you know, subterranean operations moving forward. So if we were to look back, right, I think, I think some of the classic American subterranean operations that, that comes to mind auto automatically are tunnel rats in Vietnam. Uh, but then also after that, during the GWAT era, we had the Afghan tunnel networks that the Taliban had been scrolling away <coughs> to the extent that we used a uh, Moab, a mother of all bombs, to try to destroy tunnel networks instead of pushing people in. Yes. But I know well, one thing that um, you talked to me about offline was the, uh, the Azov style uh, siege uh, earlier during the Russo Ukrainian war. And I mean, that. I think that it doesn't get more current than that. Now, right now, I know the Russians, as we record this, the Russians are, are, are a little bit more low on combat power than they were back then. Back then, it was still early war. What did you see from that? Because that is subterranean operations. Right. So, one, it's a good modern kind of example of some of the tactical and we'll say even operational and strategic challenges and implications of subterranean warfare. So in the seas of uh, um, Mariupol, you had a, a Russian combined arms army along with like some Russian Marines and uh, VDV that air assaulted in uh, trying to seize this very, very strategic city. So it's already a strategic problem. And you've got somewhere in the ballpark of 15,000 troops pushing forward and about 2,500 to 3,000 Ukrainian defenders that retreat into these subterranean areas under underneath the Azovstal steelworks. 
So this massive Russian force is basically stopped cold upon trying to enter the facility because they're presented with this just massive challenge with about 24 kilometers of underground, you know, tunnels and areas. And it's just, it's a problem set that's going to require too much, too much, you know, too many men and too many resources to solve. So instead of actually going down there and seizing just to kind of transition to a siege and just begin to, you know, shell the steelworks with thousands of rounds of artillery, dropping airstrikes. And again, earlier in the war, they were using their precision, uh, precision cruise missiles and kind of, you know, tactical missile and rocket systems trying to shake the Ukrainians. But uh, the Ukrainian defenders were basically able to hold off this vastly superior force because those subterranean areas just presented too complex of a problem set for the Russian military. However, comma, ultimately they were successful at the end of the siege because the Ukrainians ended up facing enough kind of medical and logistics problems that they had to surrender. So in, in that case, you can see how the problem was ultimately solved by, you know, not necessarily a bypass, but through this siege. So instead of seizing it, they just more or less, you know, starved them out. So if we take Azovstal as just a scenario right that's not even a very urbanized location it's just a structure that was built there with soviet roots of hardening it for potentially a bomb shelter and they did evidently a very good job at building a hardened structure for that a, a defensive location now i think one of the reasons we also look at sub t is as we look at different hot spots around the world ukraine and russia has obviously gone hot if we look at other places that are warming up, let's say, uh, mainland China and Taiwan, we look at North and South Korea, we look at Japan, potentially being just by proximity to those locations. Yeah. All, these, all these places are highly urbanized locations. And I, I, it may be a little bit difficult for someone who grew up in rural Kansas to think about how urbanized it is. Well, not even just Kansas, but the West. The Far East is so much more urbanized than the West. Um, like I, I grew up in Hong Kong, and the underground railway is extensive. But on top of that, you also have a lot of underground shopping centers. You have a lot of deep structures that are civic, that people just use every day. And you're talking about being able to starve the Ukrainians in Azovstal until they surrender, right? By cutting off all the entry and exit choke points. A lot of these places in the Far East, if something were to touch off, they have so many entry and exit choke points yeah. that it would be virtually impossible to easily seal off every single piece of it because it's not just one facility. All right. of these places are, are connected through subterranean networks. Whew. Yeah, and again, you know, as soon as you go underground, all battlefield effects are amplified. And the subterranean environment is kind of characterized by easily severed lines of communication, easily severed uh, supply lines, uh, being easily cut off from infill or exfil points. And uh, again, the use of any type of seaburn weapon or even just conventional explosives, all those effects are going to be amplified and more persistent in a subterranean environment. And as you say, there's a lot of commonalities, you know, everything that's old is new again. There's a lot of commonalities with what we're looking at in modern operating concepts with what, you know, we used to see in like airland battle. Some have even described, you know, the multi-domain operations, the army's future operating concept is airland battle with a little special sauce. Um, but what's different is because of all the technology, um, because of the different command and control capabilities, everything's happening faster. Um, and there are more capabilities at more domains available at lower echelons. So it's everything all together all at once. So what was already a complex operating environment is now incredibly difficult to operate in because you have all the complexities of the train itself. You have all the complexities of the rapidly evolving modern operating environment 
with all the different capabilities and the speed at which things are happening, it just makes, like you said, sub T environment in modern times kind of nightmare fuel. I mean, let's not even look at a deliberate chemical biological nuclear weapon. What if there's a fire? Yeah. It's fires fires happen in firefights. Yes. All the time. And huh? again, one of the things is a lot of what makes up our, you know, atmosphere and what's around us is heavier than air. So these sub T areas, they don't they aren't really inhabitable without ventilation. So if power's ever cut off in say, you know, like an actual big boy war, like it would be. You know, if the ventilation is not there, or it's not working, some of these areas may be uninhabitable without the, you know, case of fire, you know, something that consumes oxygen and smoke that displaces oxygen out of this area, in which place with no working ventilation, there's no way to get oxygen. So asphyxiation, you know, hypoxia, these are all very, very dangerous threats in addition to the enemy. Okay, so that's, that's terrifying. Um... So let's let's look at if we were going underground to fight instead of strapping on a bunch of stuff to to keep us alive like we're just fighting astronauts down 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 in in, in the tunnels. Yeah. Um what about drones? I mean obviously you're denied from any aerial drones at right. this point. Are there any could we take solace that maybe we would have drones do the dirty work for us? I know this is an ethical problem as yeah. well, but what do you think about that? And specifically with the term dirty work, uh, so autonomous drones are, are a thing, uh, you know, are a current thing, but autonomous weapon systems is something that is heavily debated and, or it's kind of one of the more heavily debated emerging concepts in warfare is, you know, what are the moral and ethical implications for autonomous weapons? But besides that, uh, something I wanted to bring up is, so DARPA hosts, hosts these challenges every once in a while. And when they host them, it's usually because there's an identified capability gap, not maybe not just in the defense industry, but in, you know, just domestically in the U.S. in industry as a whole. And in 2021, they hosted the DARPA Sub-T Challenge, where basically invited teams to design drones to come and compete and perform a series of challenges. And there was like $3.5 million in prize money. And they kind of graded them on how they mapped, searched, and exploited these underground environments and graded them against a number of criteria like autonomy, Again, how well they were able to operate autonomously networking, which is their kind of communications, their ability to maintain or operate in kind of a comms interrupted or denied environment. Um, and then just like overall effectiveness of how well they were able to achieve the tasks and then mobility, you know, how were they able to get around. So what this does is it injects kind of a, a shot of brain power and money into these areas that DARPA identifies for these challenges so that these capabilities can start to be developed. So it's, it's kind of a way for them to jumpstart industry into filling gaps that they identify by just having a challenge and offering some prize money and with the potential of contracts on the back end. So there's so capabilities that we're, you know, maybe not have yet, but that we're working towards and could have in the very near future. So, I mean, are we talking about artificial intelligence, you know, drones being able, you're saying autonomous, like, are you talking about drones being able to think for themselves because they have no communications with a commander on the ground level? Well, and there's, there's different, you know, flavors of autonomy. You know, you can have an autonomous weapon that is not necessarily AI enabled, um, or you could have something that is enabled by, you know, a narrow AI model. So it could be either or. Because uh, I, look, I, I, I'm on social media quite a bit. And like I, you, you've seen the videos of the Chinese walking dogs with a machine gun strapped to the back. Yes. 
that that's terrifying like if you're a strike team having to go take a position and you've got a gi- giant swarm of machine gun dogs running at you that don't need to breathe air and they just smoke the entire place with cx i mean holy crap <laughs> yeah. that's another thing you know we're, we're almost branching off but what's interesting about us again in the u.s we're heavily debating you know the kind of moral ethical implications of autonomous weapons and what authorities you know do we develop them in the first place if we do what authorities do we give them and then how do we you know keep a human in the loop and what decisions do they make and what decisions do the machines make but this technology is at our doorstep and there's other countries that don't have the same moral and ethical restraints that we impose upon ourselves so yeah so let's look at it this way if you were to put together a squad of um of people and uh money was no money was of of no object here right let's load out a squad of let's say nine uh, soldiers yep. specialized training what would you what would you sort of look at um specialized weapon systems specialized calm systems yep. um survival systems first aid systems Let's look at this from, you know, if you were to load or, or put together a Ashley's, Ashley's soldiers, like <laughs> Ashley's, Ashley's nine, Ashley's nine going down, down to, uh, uh, down to flush out some mole rats, let's say. Right. So biggest thing is, you know, I'd probably take, you know, kind of a traditional squad if we're, if we're looking at that, that amount. So I'd want two fire teams. So with two fire teams, I'd want, because I'm trying to think if I would want automatic rifles or machine guns, uh, we're just going to go big or go home. So I'm going to say something like a 240 Lima, uh, but with the oh. I can. So Ashley actually called me after this interview and wanted to revise her choice of the M240 Lima belt-fed machine gun, which I agree with her. Here it is. So in lieu of a 240 Lima, what would actually be better to choose for these teams is an automatic rifle. So a 240 is going to be big, it's going to be heavy and bulky and really difficult to drag underground. Also, you can't really easily shoulder a 240 Lima. So it kind of denies you the ability to really easily participate in the stack. I mean, you could for a short amount of time, but we're talking about... Uh, long enduring combat operations, you know, they're going to get smoked pretty quickly. And the 240 Lima is most effective when fired from the prone. Though there are times it's appropriate, you don't necessarily want to go to the prone in an urban environment, except in a very few situations, because it denies you the ability to move and react quickly in what is a very rapidly changing environment. So, something like the M27 IAR or a Mark 46 provides you with that suppression so that you can lock down long axes, you can achieve suppression, you can lock down wide areas and really enable forward maneuver or also regain the initiative if you're being suppressed uh, down one of these corridors. So it's massively important, but an automatic rifle, in addition to providing you that suppressive and maneuver capability, they can shoulder the rifle, they can still stack up, and then there's also, like with the M27 IAR, commonality of magazines, which helps mitigate the logistical issues that you're going to run into from the potential of very easily being cut off from your supporting element, and then just the sheer rates of ammunition consumption uh, underground by having that commonality of magazines. So again, something for big axes of advance, something to achieve suppression, because again, Everything is more, which means the concussion from those guns is more, but it also means that the lethal and suppressive effects it's going to provide me are going to be amplified as well. So machine guns are effective, are just as effective, you know, underground as they are above ground. Uh, So Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, again, two belt feds. You could also use some automatic rifles in that role, but we'll just say a machine gunner. And I'm just going to... 40 Lima because I love it and suppress to kind of mitigate that pressure a little bit. So you would use a suppressed belt fed machine gun. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, So, so, so so we've got, we've got the gunners. Yeah. So first off, you know, I I would say that everything would use a suppressor because anybody who's ever done, you know, mounts or, you know, shoot houses and shot 
with a team in very, very close confined areas, over pressures a thing and it can be at a minimum distracting. Um, and the worst part is, you know, whenever you get that really loud concussion, the point at which it actually makes you flinch and kind of stop focusing on what you're supposed to be focusing on, we're talking about a close quarters environment. Like that's potentially deadly. So mitigating that concussion and also with suppressors, mitigating flash. So that's why I would choose suppressors for everything. Uh, for everything else, we're looking at, uh, you know, probably short barreled rifles for almost the rest of everybody in the team. And then, so short barreled, I would probably go like, oh, what is it? Is it like, it's like a 12.5, 416? Okay. Um, so something along those lines, a shorter barreled rifle. And then at least two. So we'll say Ashley as the team leader and then at least one breacher on each team with a, a PDW of some sort. You know? So interesting that the, the loadout that you just described honestly mirrors sort of like a World War II loadout more than anything. So you've got your machine gun crews yeah. and then you've got your riflemen and then you've got your leadership that, that runs submachine guns and, and short automatic uh, weapon systems, yeah. specialized automatic systems. Yeah. And the other thing too is you're going to have to have it's going to be very, very heavy loadouts. So, ammunition logistics you're talking about. Yes. Because uh, another thing that you see, so again, everything's more underground. You're talking about, we'll just talk about casualties first. So, if you're looking at sustainment, uh, you know, first thing is casualties. I think it's 30% for every 12 hours is kind of the casualty rates for subterranean fighting. And then it is literally double. What you would see, you know, normal conventional operations above ground, it's going to be double that for all munitions expo or expenditures. So that's explosives and ammunition. So we'll say we would have a well-trained team. So, you know, fragmentation grenades, you're going to want flashbang grenades. I probably would not want smoke grenades because, again, that's something that's never going to dissipate. In that environment, you know, you're going to have, you, you always struggle with smoke in the subterranean environment because almost everything you do, you know, your weapon systems, your munitions, they all produce smoke. You know, sometimes even just walking could kick up dust off the ground. So it's visibility is key. And then. So what about armor? What about armor? Because armor points two ways when you're talking about a very hyper compact environment, especially if you're crawling through air ducts and everything. Yeah. What would you look at as far as armor loadout? So something probably, you know, level four, uh, level four A, but as light as I could get it, as thin as I could get it, swimmers cut because you need the mobility, you know, potentially crawling through that. And then again, it goes against what I would want to say, but if I'm having to choose kind of, you know, sight unseen, they'd probably be going in at a minimum of MOP2, or they would be going in at MOP2 with the ability to upgrade. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I would say is in the vehicles have SCBAs. Can you tell, not everyone in the mil has, has served in the military, can you explain what MOP2 is to the audience? So MOP2 is basically where you're wearing your, your outer garments, you're wearing the blouse and the pants of your, your MOP suit, but you're not wearing gloves or the overboots or your mask. And uh, well, let me see, uh, MOP is what, mission-oriented protective... Posture. Posture. Okay, so basically what MOP is, is there are four levels of MOP, and MOP is basically the chemical suits that you would wear in the military. And for the different levels, MOP 2 is basically just the chemical suit without any re um, respiration protection. And then I think next level you drop the respirator on, right? Right, yeah. yeah. So you, you posture up to just put your mask on, yep. and the hood, of course over the mask and then after that it's your gloves and your boots you know for the final level so obviously that stuff would have to be carried on you that that's where another challenge is, is you need a lot of shit, but you're dealing with <laughs> confined spaces 
Right. Oh. Okay. That would be uh, horrendous to carry a 240 Lima with plus basic load with level 4A with mop gear on. So what, what about comms? How would you solve the comms issue? So it's basically mandatory to have some sort of noise canceling headset for every team member. So back when... When I had this, you know, I made a lot of requests because they're like, hey, what type of equipment do you need for this mission set? And I, being a good leader, asked for the moon and the stars, and I got like one or two things. But one of the things we did use was uh, kind of Peltor-style headsets for at least all of leadership. Uh, for this, since money is no object, uh, again, we'll just say Peltors for the entire team because it does two things. You know, one, it helps deal with the overpressure. It helps deal with the noise. Um, the second piece is it enables communication, because if you've ever fired a machine gun in a concrete tube, there's not a lot of talking going on when that's happening. <laughs> uh, so the noise canceling headsets that are integrated into your comms harness is is a must. Uh, and then we'll just also say that it, with, with comms, how about some well rehearsed hand and arm signals and then also visual signaling techniques. So methods of marking different things, uh, methods of, you know, signaling that involve other than hand and arm signals. So in the army, we would say like our, our dog tails or flaming rocks or mm -hmm. all that stuff, you know, chem lights, just however you're going to, to mark different things. For some of the audience out there, a lot of times you use chem, li chem lights or light sticks. Those are chemical light sticks. Uh, you use them to mark rooms that you've been through, paths that you've gone through. Sometimes you use that to signal for any follow-on units. Uh, so that's how you use ChemLight. But that's that's a good this is so that's a good segue over to the low light, no light scenario that we're um, facing here. Um, how would you have them load out for uh, night vision? as far as, you know, their, their equipment on the team. And well, again, it's uh, money is of no object here. So I know this is a big piece. Right. So that becomes very, very interesting because you can be one there. There's very little security underground. You know, your security is basically through, you know, not being compromised as you're moving and or overwhelming firepower. So it's either being covert or having massive amounts of overwhelming firepower, the only two ways you're going to actually achieve kind of security in a subterranean environment. So NODS becomes a very interesting question to that. So one, you're going to need some sort of optical system because most subterranean areas are artificially lit, but you can never count on that. So what you're going to always potentially be dealing with is not a low loom, but no loom environment. Night vision goggles having, you know, kind of ampli magnifying and amplifying ambient light. If there's no ambient light to amplify, nods aren't going to do you any good. So those will have to be paired with illuminators. We wore our ours on the helmet. And then you can also use illuminators on your, your lasers on your weapon system. But the flip side of that coin is if the enemy uses nods, and you being covert is one of the ways to prevent compromise. Guess what? Well, it's it's going to be like a, you know, light show coming down the tunnel towards them with all that shit turned on. So, what about what about thermal overlays? That's so that is the other option. Is if you end up using thermals, um, it is an option for you to be able to see without you know potentially having to use IR illuminators for some things. However, comma, you know, then it comes down to aiming systems. You know, you may end up having to, like, passively aim. Like, I just, I'm not, there's not as many aiming solutions for thermal optics, especially if they're, like, head-worn thermal optics, uh, like there are for... They're more, they're more observation tools or, like, a, a vehicle... A vehicle mounted aiming solution rather than a mobile foot mobile solution right and, and even then you know if you're just conducting movement a thermal optic on your your weapon system which is usually where we see them 
is not going to do you that much good because you're going to be forced to like be walking as you're look like it's just it's, it's not practical and then mm. if you're using thermal you know thermal goggles it's it's a question of how are you going to what aiming devices are you, you going to use with it but specifically i was talking about overlays though like yeah. i've never i've never i left in 15 so we didn't have those things yet uh i mean I've never seen what it's actually like using thermals with over with the thermal overlay on top of your night vision. I mean, would that at at all change the um, uh, a given give the soldiers an edge in this type of environment? The ones that I've used, I would say potentially. So that could potentially be an option is to use the the nod, something like a PSQ-20 uh, with the thermal overlay. So the hybrid site that you can kind of dial um, between the thermal and what level of thermal and what level of IR you're getting into the device. Um, the one thing is a lot of those kind of hybrid optics, at least ones that I've had experience with, eat batteries like it's their job. Mm -hmm. So... You know, you'll you'll put a ton of batteries in a power pack, and it lasts you four hours, and then you're replaced. And that becomes a significant challenge in itself because, again, subterranean everything is more. So, batteries are consumed at almost like triple the rate of what they are in any other type of environment because you're having to run the nods, the illuminators, and then all the sensors which is something we didn't talk about yet that you're probably going to want to take down there with you if supply logistics could could come down to how much could a soldier put on his or her back and yep. conduct continuous operations and that's not just about munitions it's also, it's also about food and water because yep. you're not going to go down to the subway station and use a life straw to drink water that's been dripping down from the ceiling right that's just you no know. Uh, so uh, the sustainment, I guess the sustainment and the ammunition logistics problem to me is probably one of the largest hindrances of, of a long-term operation. So how, what, what do you think about that as far as like extending your work time down, down in a tunnel per se? I mean, it depends on, on the opposing force, depends on the size of the facility, it depends on the size fighting, like. But as you, so it's hard to say, you know, like, oh, you know, you could last 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. But what I think the big piece is, is highlighting how difficult it is to supply. Because like I said, you know, Ashley's dream team or Ashley's tunnel rats, you know, you'd want to go in with basically nothing other than, you know, batteries, you know, water, ammunition, and any sort of, you know, explosive that you were using as well as sensor breaching equipment. Mm -hmm. Like you can be carrying, any, you know, food or anything else and you'd be distributing all that amongst the team because you still have to fight down there. So supply really is the issue. Cause again, one of the things that characterizes that environment is it's really, really easy to cut off lines of communication and lines of, you know, lines of supply, you know, your exfil and infill points. And so, It'd be very, very easy to get cut off from resupply or from the ability to, you know, medevac in, in that type of environment. So it's... I, I think that's also like on the tactic side. Yeah. It's very dangerous for you to overpunch um, yeah. as a little assault team and yeah. really stray away from your, your, your line of control. Yeah. I mean, imagine going just too far and then getting absolutely surrounded and then basically... <laughs> That's it. Yeah. I mean, they could they could literally lock you in a hallway if you go past an enemy line and they lock all the doors. Right. Very, very easily. You know, or, you know, heaven forbid, you know, you could lose massive amounts of combat power. Uh, something like a complex ambush in the subterranean environment is the, in, you know, it's the absolute essence of what you're talking about, that nightmare fuel. Somebody initiates an ambush with explosives and then opens up on you when you're basically stuck in a concrete tube. Like the amount of men you could lose within seconds is just like all of them. Uh, you ever seen uh, The Rock? 
You remember the shower scene? Yeah. So, yeah. so, so sort of like that. Basically, uh, in The Rock, the Navy SEALs were, were going into uh, Alcatraz to seize yeah. these uh, poison gas rockets. And these guys went through the entire underground tunnel with Sean Connery. Um, they, they go into the one point, the choke point of the entire operation, is they had to go into the shower room and figure out from there where to get to all those rockets that they had to seize. But then, of course, they tripped the uh, they tripped the alarm, and then all those Marines lined up top as they came out from the the bottom of the shower room and just smoked all of them. Didn't you have to even use explosives? That's that is an ambush. That's a classic ambush right there. Yeah, I mean, you know, hey, we've got Seaburn, we've got you know PDW submachine guns, we've got breaching operations. You don't need to watch this to learn about sub T. Just go watch The Rock, you know. <laughs> So I'll be sure to include uh, Sir Sean Connery on my uh, my dream breaching team. <laughs> uh, may, he, may he rest in peace. Yeah, indeed. Okay, so we looked at the possibility of uh, why we would look at sub-sea operations because potential flashpoints around the world. And even if not, just the buildup, just a trajectory of human civilization. As we overpopulate the world, people generally gravitate towards urban areas and, and as urban areas build up, we have more people, a higher density of people living there. And so from that, we end up with, that's why we want to have a capability of doing subterranean operations because these places will exist. Now, if something like that happens, we talked about some of the constraints, whether it comes to weapon systems, logistics, comms, uh, even food. And and then we also even, even talked about a lot of real world scenario, whether it's actual Azov style situation or fictional, the, the rock, uh, and how some of these subterranean uh, operations could play out. Is there anything else that you think like we really should be looking at if we're look, looking at a possibility of, um, of subterranean operations? One of the big things about sub T that we hadn't talked about yet is breaching. Mm -hmm. And because sub T is going to be a series of breaching operations, you know, even exfiltrating, um, if you're using a, a, an entry or exit that you had not previously secured is a form of a breaching operation. So, you know, just emphasizing the importance of the fundamentals of breaching. So your SOSRA, you know, suppress, obscure, secure, reduce, and assault. And then also your methods of breaching, because, you know, there are, oh gosh, it's like four methods of breaching, right? You can do mechanical, explosive, ballistic, or vehicular. Vehicular meaning you drive a vehicle through something. But... <laughs> All the striker brigades in Iraq. <laughs> right, right. But obviously you're very, very restricted underground in what you want to use. So suppose you have some massively high-trained individuals. Uh, sure, you could potentially use explosive breaching, and it's going to be very... But... You may want to focus on other means of breaching, like mechanical, or you know, you can use something like a thermal lance or a breach pin if you have to actually breach uh, you know, a secured you know, door or pathway or obstacle. And so but all, all of that continues to add equipment to your to your soldiers. Yes, yeah, so you're trying and all of that you continue to add the strain of logistics onto yeah. your individual soldier at that point. Yeah. Yes, and it's it's always going to be a balance of what's my threat, what's my actual mission, you know, what am I trying to accomplish, and balancing, okay, how much stuff do I actually need, and how much can I assume risk on as far as ammunition load, because you want to maintain a, you know, light force that can operate in these very, very constrained spaces, um, if they're operating in armor or with mop gear, their internal body temperatures are going to be elevated. They're going to consume water at higher rates and they got to fight in those conditions. So it's, what do I absolutely need? What can I do without? And trying to find that balance is one of the art pieces of sub T. I think a lot of people would probably dismiss this as something unlikely until they see the environment or see the location that we're, we're working on we're potentially working in, uh, in the future. How, how much of this is on your mind on a day-to-day -day basis? 
You know, one of my favorite sayings is there's two sides to every coin. And so I'll say it's something that I think about, something that I believe is important. But at the same point in time, you know, kind of the, again, you know, first thing about fighting in a basement is you're fighting in a basement. You know, you don't want to do it. So if there's any way, shape, form to bypass, you know, drop the entrances and exits, bypass, just don't deal with it, then do that. But at the same point in time, because we're going to be increasingly operating in urban areas and there may be something in that subterranean area, there may be a military asset that you need to go down there to destroy. It may be terrain that you need to seize or secure uh, to achieve a greater purpose there, or it may be an area that you can exploit to gain a dynamic advantage over the enemy. So at some point in time, you know, in a future war, we will have to go underground. And it's good to at least be familiar with some of the unique challenges and techniques um, and special equipment that you might need to use in that type of environment. Last thing that I would say is, you know, mission commands, um, two components, and it'll be quick. One, you're going to be operating in a comms denied environment. You're going to be under concrete, earth, reinforced steel. Your communications will likely go down. So it's using repeaters or some other sort of creative way, like an old uh, telephone, or an old field telephone with DR8 wire to communicate uh, to like a radio operator stationed by the entrance or something, or ways to reach back with communications. The second thing is mission command in the form of disciplined initiative. You have to have trained leaders that are experts at the fundamentals of urban operations and capable and comfortable with making decisions quickly uh, within the commander's intent to achieve what they need to achieve underground because you're not going to have solid control over all elements in that environment at all times. And they have to maintain that tempo, you know, it's the fundamentals of the off uh, offense, you know, surprise, concentration, audacity, tempo. You have to maintain that tempo that audacity to actually be successful because the second that you hold up, you're just increasing the risk that's already astronomic to begin with. So all in with that. So, so what I'm hearing there is with a lack of communications, be flexible in the equipment that you use and train and trust your men correctly. Yep. And just move on from that. Yep. So everybody out there, that's uh, there you have it. Some, uh, Thoughts on subterranean operations with my friend Ashley. And if you are interested in following Ashley's social media, she is active on Instagram with the handle Angel of Verdun. How do you uh, how do you spell it out with the uh, with the underscores? Yeah, so it's there's an underscore before Angel and then two underscores on either side of of. So underscore okay. Angel or of underscore Verdun. All right. And uh, reach out to Ashley if you have any thoughts, comments. Uh, if you enjoyed this conversation, feel free to come back and comment in the comments section. But I'd love to have Ashley back. We'd love to have you back for further on conversations. But until then, Ashley, I guess we will see the audience around. <laughs>